we begin recording. And if you like, Trish, I can start singing and then you can introduce after that as I'm walking in from the kitchen. What do you think? Okay. Okay. Begin. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> It gives me tremendous joy to welcome Dr. Noreen Nirian for our final keynote, and she began it in her own inimitable way. Dr. Noreen Nirian is an internationally acclaimed musician, a singer, a scholar, a composer, a writer, and an interfaith minister. She studied music at University College Cork under Sean O'Reilly, and she did postgraduate work in the musical expertise of religion in the Irish tradition. She looked at traditional Irish Gaelic music. She is an expert on Gregorian chant, and she's also somebody who has studied theology. She graduated with a PhD in theology from Mary Immaculate College, Limerick, and her thesis was on the specificity of Christian theosony towards a theology of listening. And again, with her incredible creativity, Noreen created a new theological concept or term theosony to explore sonance sound in terms of human response to and relationship with the divine. She's performed all over the globe with a whole variety of people and she has recorded several albums, some of them with 
big household names like Sinead O'Connor. She's an expert on Celtic music, Shannos, the ancient Irish tradition of singing. And she plays, you just heard her there, the Indian harmonium, the shruti box, and the fadog, the Irish tin whistle. She's been artist in residence in several places, places around Ireland, and she's published several books, one of them on theosophy towards a theology of listening, where she outlines her own vision for listening to and interpreting the, design, the divine sound in sheer silence. Noreen ta falcha on down roads. Konnsa ta tu an trnonasha. How are you? Inig an kogal so. Ta nishkitimini oransa. Mar Trish agus Ian agus Carly kogar the kas. Mar yenshiv tawa obir kona anrod sha. A value agus Alanoint Araig, Agasvig Hall Law, Driachtoil, Agwinda. Thank you so much. This was so well, wasn't it, everybody? I I was stuck to the screen for the past two days. All the treasures we got, the cornucopia, the crane bag, or indeed, as Patrick Kavanagh would say, the pockets of God were opened for us, you know, over the past two days. So thank you. And it's such an honor to be here and it really is so um, special to be with this group of people, you know, and something really will happen to thank you too for uh, agreeing to have a conversation with me, Trish, because, you know, any time that I'm with you, you just and with everybody that you just ignite a fire. And on that level, will we light a candle? connecting each of us, not just each of us here, but each of us on this conference and indeed beyond. Because, of course, in the Irish tradition, you see, we we believe, like when we say that somebody is is, is dead, we never say, for she marav, we'd say, ta a quinnel mochta riv vracha an lay, which is beautiful. It means that her candle is extinguished before the dawning of day. So in heaven, when we're born, a candle is ignited for each one of us and it keeps burning away sometimes during the, the hollow lands and the hilly lands. It might flicker a little and the when the storms and the rains of life and anxieties pass us by there, it may flicker at times. But of course, sometimes for some people that candle can be very short, depending on the time of, that they're called back. And you were saying something beautiful there before the, the um, our friends joined us, Trish, about that bridge of light. Yeah, I was I was saying that I was listening to a wonderful paper today um, by um, a person called Geraldine Brazel, who was recalling the work of women in the 19th century writing in the popular press, and they were working with people who were ill orphans, the poor, the sick, and they were describing the openness that people had to death and that they saw death as a bridge from this life to the next life and as a light going to the eternal light. So there was a real sense of openness to that in the 19th century. And, you know, I'm wondering, we're talking today about the treasures recalling the treasures of Catholic spiritual tradition through the creative arts. Have we lost that sense of openness to the divine, to the spiritual? I don't think so, Trish, because as we've heard repeatedly, that's in each one of us, how strong that's going to be or how weak. And I'm always thinking over the two days now, I've been thinking lots of different thoughts and that lovely shanuckle has come into my mind. An rod a tawgwing, beach shagwing. An rod a tawgwing, beach shagwing. That which we, which we have, an rod a tawgwing, which is our belief, our Catholicism. Beach shagwing, may we celebrate it. So that which we have, let us not get bogged down in the dark stories. And of course, every religion has its dark stories. And you and I are very much fired by other religions as well. But let's celebrate 
and celebrate that essence within each of us, you know. And I was also thinking of that lovely prayer of Julian of Norwich while I was waiting for you to come in there. Julian, of course, being the first woman writer, known woman writer in the English language. And she says, Holy Spirit, spirit of love, spirit of discipline. In the silence, come to us and bring us your peace. Rest in us that we may be tranquil and calm. Speak to us as each heart needs to hear. And that's what's happened this week. Speak to us as each heart, each and every heart needs to hear. Reveal to us things hidden and things longed for. Rejoice in us that we may praise and be glad. Pray in us that we may be at one with you and each other. Refresh us, renew us from the well of your living waters. Holy Spirit, dwell in us and let your light shine through us. And in our hearts, may you find your homeliest home. And in our hearts, may you find your homeliest home and endless dwelling. Amen. Amen. Noreen, when it comes to, like Julian was saturated with a sense of the divine. God was everywhere in everything. And again, your emphasis on listening with the ear of the heart to the divine, listening to God. You have that great sense of connection to the divine. Where does that come from, Noreen? Karavas, Aishin. Well, in our era, Hagen Shein, Asim Dorkas, Mar Nurevid's Og, Vies Tribliotach, Agus Vi Anna Imnir, Vies Anna Imnir. When I was young, I was an awkward troubled child. But I suppose I developed very early on. You see, just in a tiny background, um, we're speaking here from Limerick. And so I just was brought up, um, born on the, sh on the shores of Loch Gore here, and then brought up in Carraghanlish, just five miles from here. And my father was a very successful businessman in Limerick City. My mother was a primary teacher. I was the youngest of three siblings, and my other two two older were in boarding school. So I was a lot on my own. And I had to develop a friendship which came through very much through the hour, through my ear, you know. And I was getting all sorts of intuitions there at a very early age. So I think I developed it as a kind of a skill there, Trish, you know, um, because I really believe that we've neglected our listening. You know, Nelly Sachs, everybody will say that, you know, the Jewish writer. We have forgotten how to listen. We have forgotten how to listen. And then you know yourself, Trish, there are 4,200 religions in the world. 4,200. Now, they all fall into the branches of the, into the sects of the eight main religions. But they'll all agree on two things. On two things. At all. Gach, really going to our role. One is the importance of listening. And the second is the real orga, the golden rule. All religions have that golden rule. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Or even in the negative, do not do to others what you would not have done to you. I think we to our peril have forgotten those in the Roman Catholic tradition. We didn't listen over the years, not simply to the victims, but I think to the perpetrators too, because they too had their story of darkness that they had to hide. I'm not condoning anything at all, but I'm saying Listening was so important there. As is that golden rule, do unto others as you would have done unto you. So tell me, Noreen, are, 
I know that you are interested in dialogue and you talk about a lot about dialogue and Pope Francis, you know, is talking about dialogue and John Pope John Paul II is talking about dialogue and Christ engaged in dialogue. The risen Christ on the road to Emmaus in the Gospels, you find Christ constantly engaging in dialogue with people. But tell me about it because you interpret it through a Gaelic lens, Gia Log. So tell us about that. You see, you've hit on so many things there, Christ. And of course, it was one of the most important dialogues was when he called Mary Magdalene, whose feast day was yesterday, which I thought was wonderful that you were starting the, the conference with the blessing of Mary Magdalene. And yes, a dialogue, you see, because in a conversation, and that's why I, I, I love being in conversation, um, Trish, with you, um, there's a third person, there's a third presence always listening in a dialogue, in any true dialogue. And that's the spirit that's nudging and that's conducting like a symphony, that's conducting that conversation for whatever, as Julian would say, whatever needs to be heard to be said. And I do an old bit of spiritual direction because our ministry um, um, trained us in, in spiritual counselling. And honestly, Trish, it's quite amazing, you know, when you're talking with people, what emerges. Now, nothing psychological, of course, because I'm not trained in that. But just you get moments where the spirit intervenes. I could keep you here with stories all evening, but that's not the, the, why we're here. But just that there is a th listening third presence in every true conversation. That dia or that nart, as we'd say in Irish, the, that spirit. And then, yeah, sorry. I, I'm just wondering for anybody who doesn't know, dia, D-I-A is the word for God in Gaelge. So dialogue is, you know, it involves the divine. It is dialogue involving God. Um, so, Noreen, your your sense of sound and sonance and your theosony, that has really been aided to with because of your musical life and your musical giftedness and the creative arts. They're at the heart of your Catholic faith. So tell us about that. Tell us about music and song and prayer through song, Gregorian chant, music. Yes. Um. You see, I suppose the music, I've always been a singer and I've had a very, again, a very troubled relationship with singing because between the ages of 14 and 35, I couldn't sing for anybody because I was ridden with nervousness. And so it took me a long time before 14 and then after 35, I'm now 70. After that, I suddenly, through meeting people, through praying, realized that the singing was not about performance or not about me or not, that it was about actually the listener. And I was merely a conduit for that through music to bring people, a kind of ministry, really, Trish, to bring people through sound. And but then, of course, when I started my research, which I was so privileged that Eamon Conway there in, in Mary I took me on as his first doctorate in theology. And um, I had, of course, to study the biology of the ear. And oh, friends, it is by far the most sophisticated and the most sensitive of our senses. And for instance, you heard Mark Patrick talk the other day about after two, the, in the second month of impregnation that we suddenly become away from feminine, the female chromosomes or whatever, and that we either go male or female. But we'll say after five weeks, this is what they call the ectoderm of our being begins to develop. And that's where our skin is, our nervous system our eyes and our inner ears. And then after 23 weeks, we can actually hear sounds outside of the womb. 
Now they'll be muffled. People have described it like the sound of a washing machine. Then after 26 weeks, more sounds again, and we begin to hear outside sounds. And if our mother was shouted to, if we cried while we were carrying our children, if we sang, all of these sounds are beginning to be taken up. And then, of course, after eight months, you're hearing the sounds of outside. There's a preparation for the sounds that you're going to, to meet. And that's why I remember when Mial and I were carrying our children, little, we didn't know we were totally unconscious of this, but we were always singing and making sounds to the womb and sending sounds in and out to the womb. And I really believe that has made a tremendous difference to our sons, you know, because they're are surrounded by music too and have all these memories of Brandenburg concertos and little sounds that we were playing with at the time. So our ears are terribly important, the first to develop and the last to atrophy, of course. So you have to be very careful when you're with somebody who's dying that you don't say, oh, terrible bitch, that you do anything bad about them, that you only say positive things. But amazing there, I could keep you here with the facts of around your ears. So God wants us to be all ears. And then, as I was sharing with you when we met the other day, Trish, in medieval iconography, many of the Annunciation images, beautiful Annunciation images, have Gabriel here, Mary sitting, listening, and a dove coming into her ear. So that the incarnation happened. Mary conceived through the ear. I think it's Alexandria, my third century saint said that, that Mary heard the child Jesus through her ear. So, Noreen, when you were um, doing your research on religious music in the Celtic, in the Irish tradition, that had a profound impact on your own spirituality. Tell us about that, about the songs, Queen and Imagine. And yeah. Yeah. Well, you see, there was such a presence, a divine feminine presence in the songs, the religious songs from the Irish tradition. There aren't that many of them now. I collected as many as were there, only about 40 songs, really. Trish that came down will say, singer singing words and music together. Whereas you have lots of ancient 12th century poems by Moel Iso Polkon. Deus me, Deus me. But that was set to a tune in the 1950s. The text is 12th century, all right. But the ones that came down together, very, very special. And I would claim that they were composed by women because they're all the time there with Mary at the foot of the cross, looking at her son there. And as a keening woman and as a mother carrying her child in her womb, it's very beautiful. It's a great sense of the feminine. And of course, Bridget comes in because Bridget was foster mother to Christ in the Irish tradition or indeed um, was a, a breast feeder to um, Christ to in the Irish tradition. Isagon comes out well, as well as other, other saints. But you know, there's a whole tradition of a whole genre of songs, as you say, around Queen, around lamentation. Queen is the Irish for lamentation. And I want to sing you two little versions actually of a song, just to show you even the tradition, how it can vary from one end of our, let's say this is a, a bad map of Ireland, from one end of our little country to another, how a Connemara, a Donegal version of this same text can be so different to a monster version of the same text. It's quite extraordinary. And of course, a lot of people would say that each of these musical versions are reflecting the landscape of the area. So we'll say the Donegal one that I'm going to sing you now is quite spiky and rocky, and is it, 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 the same as the Connemara one. And then the monster one is very much uh, luscious and, uh, you know, it's a very broad range. Now, would I see if you don't lose me here now? I'll sit down here. And so this is, um, can you see me there again? We can see you. Thank you, Noreen. We can see you. And so this is a beautiful version of that dialogue, that dialogue between 
Mary at the foot of the cross and Christ on the cross, where she says, she addresses Peter first. She says, Peter, apostle, have you seen my son so bright? Machon is machon all, which is our expression of grief and distress. Machon is machon all. I saw him midst his enemies, a harrowing sight. Machon is machon all. Who is that fine man on the passion tree? Machon is machon all. Tis your son, dear mother. No, you're not me. Machon is machon all. Is that the wee babe I bore nine months in my womb? Machon is machon all. That was born in a stable when no house would give us room. Machon is machon all. Mother, mother, be quiet. Let not your heart be torn. Machon is machon all. My keening women are yet to be born. Mahon is Mahon. Mahu, Noreen. Thank you so much, Noreen. 
and we notice the silence is so, so important. Silence is so important, isn't it, for spiritual life, Noreen? Yeah, Meister Eckert, all the great mystics say that in silence, you know, and of course you can't talk about sound without talking about silence. Yeah. And it's the sister side of it, you know. And there's that wonderful, and again, all traditions, all religious traditions too, the 4,200 that we talk about, they'll all agree on the importance of silence. And we don't like silence at all, so we don't, Trish. We, you know, shy away from it. Because I often think I, our... I, I think... Yeah, and you know, we were often talking too about, you know, what about our young people? How are we going to ignite that spark in them? And it's taken me an awful long time to realize that we're using the wrong language, I think, Trish, at least I am. Because I used to be often saying to our students, and you have much more experience, and so many other people here too, that I have of teaching, which I love. But, you know, in the beginning, I was always saying to my students, what do you believe in? And I would get a glazed look, and they'd start squirming in their chairs. And I realized it was the wrong question altogether. And then I suddenly hit on, what is it that matters to you most? What is the biggest thing in your life? What matters to you most? And then you can't stop them talking because they'll be talking about ecology and nature and justice and fairness and all of that. You know, so it's a way. And of course, getting them to sit in silence can be so powerful. In the beginning, when we suggested, of course, there's all sorts of twittering and unease. But suddenly they, just in the same way as asking them to listen really carefully to one another, because we I do all sorts of little exercises around listening uh, with them. And it's extraordinary how this deep listening, Rumi, you know, the 13th century Sufi poet, most read poem, I think, poet, I think, in the world. But wonderful. And I think he one time said, listen to my words and they'll carry you into God's arms. Listen to my words and they'll carry you into God. But he has a lovely poem around listening. He says, what is deep listening? Sama is what it's called in Sufism. Sama is a greeting from the secret ones inside the heart. A letter. Listening is a greeting from the secret ones inside your heart a letter the branches of your intelligence grow new leaves in this wind of new listening the body reaches a silence the body reaches a silence rooster sound comes reminding you of your love for dawn the reed flute and the singer's lips the knack of how the spirit breathes into us becomes as simple and as ordinary as eating and drinking. The dead rise with the pleasures of listening. <laughs> if someone can't hear a trumpet melody, sprinkle dirt on his head and pronounce him dead. If somebody can't hear a trumpet melody, sprinkle dirt on their head and declare them dead. Listen and feel the beauty of your separation, the unsayable absence. There's a moon inside every human being. Learn to be companions with it. Give more of your life to this listening. Give more of your life to this listening. As brightness is to time, so you are to the one who talks to the deep ear in your chest. Now here's the line. Trish, this is beautiful. I'll, I'll say it and I want you to repeat it after me, Trish, and I want other people to repeat it too because it's very beautiful. I should sell my tongue and buy a thousand ears when that one steps near and begins to speak. I'll break it up now. I should sell my tongue. I should sell my tongue. And buy a thousand ears. And by a thousand ears. When that one steps near. When that one steps near. And begins to speak. And begins to speak. Oh. 
we're coming near the end, Noreen, and I'm wondering, it's the end of our conference, and I think you have a great sense that in the Catholic tradition, everything begins with prayer, and maybe with that silence and listening to the divine, and everything ends with that. But I'm just wondering, there have been so many negative, I suppose, things that have happened, so much baggage that we carry, so much critique, perhaps, of Catholicism and its limitations, that sometimes it's hard to maintain that positivity, that energy, that connection, to be proud of it, to be, you know, honest and open about it. Um, what, what would you say to us as we go forward into the future? What would you say to us to carry us on the journey, to give us strength and hope? And hope. That's the word, isn't it, Trish? That hope to that we have to nurture and to maintain there because that hope is deep in us all, you know, even going back to Peter, the fisherman chosen by Christ. And in his letter, he says that always make known your defense and tell about the hope that's in you. And he says, do it gently and with respect and with a clear conscience. And that hope is lovely. You know, of course, Emily Dickinson, too, um, that has come up once or twice maybe in our discussions. Her description of hope is where it's always in our soul. She compares it to a bird. She says, hope is a thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. So it never leaves us. And I always think of that word too, uh, Trish Ingoeling, dochus, dochus an shenokal, no, dochus an enemokal, a ta aun. So we have hope as the noun, and that's dochus. But I love it in the verb. When you say, I hope, you say, ta suil agon, which is, I have an eye for it. So it's an eye out. Hope is simply an eye out for that unexpected glance, that unexpected insight that suddenly surprises you. And takes takes you with great enthusiasm. Lovely word, entheos in the gods. And that so our word for I hope is about I pray that I can see things in a new way. I pray that I can hear things in a new way. And I think there are great signs of hope there. We talked about the young people. We talked about interfaith dialogue that we had in this conference too. That's such a way forward. We talk about zooming and the blessings that it has been to bring us into contact all over the world. We've become zombies, as we say now, you know, together, all together. And so there's great hope. Nature, look at, we look up in the sky with great amazement now when we see a plane, whereas we, which we used to do long ago in the 50s when we were small children. And the birds are singing so much sweeter and louder every morning. So I think they're great. And look at the spiritual. I know that once or twice somebody did say, all right, that we've had great scientific knowledge being thrown at us during COVID and not much spiritual sustenance. I disagree. I think we've had an awful lot and there's so much more there online now. We can get all these talks. Ritual, of course, I think. COVID has thrown us back on the rituals of every day, lighting our candles, the ritual of making our cups of coffee, of keeping in contact with one another. Because I think our way forward is really through rituals, creating rituals ourselves now, taking it back from. It's funny, isn't it? You know, the uh, post-emancipation time when the church took everything back from the houses, you know, they took back the house dances, the dancing at the crossroads, back into the church. And the only worship was to be done in church, not in the at stations, station masses and home masses. 
But now we're beginning to take that back again into our own homes. Maureen, I think we're about to end our time. Carly, can you stop recording and we'll just get a few comments or, you know, any questions?